We are continuing with our 2018 webinar series hosted by the New York State GIS Association. Uh, we're extremely excited uh, with our uh, current um, presentation and webinar. I will keep it brief, but just a couple of housekeeping um, reminders. Uh, we will have a Q&A session at the end of the webinar, so if you have any questions, please keep them to the end, or you can send them in the text box, and we'll uh, answer those questions once we're in that period or that time frame, as well as uh, if you have any technical issues, please send those uh, uh, messages to me, and I'll try to work with you guys offline. Otherwise, uh, I hope that you enjoy this webinar. I will turn it over to David McKittrick. Uh, from Blue Marble Geogra uh, Geographics. I greatly appreciate his, his, him giving us his time and uh, knowledge and looking forward to this professional development opportunity for everyone. And with that, I'll turn that over to David. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Azim, and thank you all for, I guess, taking time out of your lunch hour, it's right about noon here, and to spend some time together uh, to address the question, what's the point in LIDAR? Hopefully you'll forgive the pun. Um, you know, the point in LiDAR. Anybody who's familiar with LiDAR will understand LiDAR are our points, so well, we'll get that over with. Um, over the course of the next uh, better part of an hour, uh, we will wrap up a little early so we do uh, have a time for some questions and answers. Questions, yes, answers, we hope. Um, we're going to introduce uh, some of the functionality related to working with LiDAR data. I I'm assuming uh, we're going to go with the lowest common denominator approach here. I'm assuming there are some of the unit attendants who have really not spent much time working with LiDAR data. So I'm going to begin today with a, a basic introduction. We're going to look at some of the, the characteristics of LiDAR. We're then going to get into looking at some practical applications of LiDAR data, working with that point cloud data. And I should say as well, much of the data that we're going to be working with today, in fact, all of the data is in the public domain. It is freely available. Um, I'm sitting here in the state of Maine right now, just a little bit to the east of where most of you are. Um, here in, the, in our state, we have an increasing collection of point cloud data that we can uh, access some LiDAR data files. Other parts of the, the, the country are the same. In fact, we're, we're very lucky here in the U.S. to have access to a large volume of, of publicly available data. So we're going to be using some of those files in our workflows today. Um, I should throw out a little bit of a disclaimer before I begin, and it's a little disconcerting when you begin a presentation with a disclaimer, but this is an important one. Now, I do work for Blue Marble Geographics. We're a software company. Um, we produce a product called Global Mapper. Now, I'm going to be using Global Mapper today to demonstrate the capability of working with data and to demonstrate the functionality related to working with LiDAR data. But my intent is not to promote the application per se. Uh, I will be using that software, but the main focus of what we're looking at today is the data, is what can you do with LiDAR. There are multiple very powerful applications out there that will also allow you to process your LiDAR data. Again, I'm a little biased. I do work with Global Mapper, so that's what I will be using today. So let's go quickly go through a structured agenda for what it's worth so we can see exactly what we're going to be covering today. Well, as I said, we're going to introduce, for those of you who are completely new to LiDAR, we'll introduce through initially through a couple of PowerPoint slides, but then when we actually get into actually looking at some files, the structure and characteristics of LiDAR. What is this stuff all about? It's interesting. I've heard conversations at various events that I've been to where people talk about LiDAR, and it's great that my, my town now has LiDAR data. But I don't know what it is. <laughs> it sounds very exciting. It sounds very cool. But can somebody tell me what exactly it is and what I can do with it? I'm hopefully going to address in a very brief way some of those questions. If you're one of those types of people, hopefully today after the end of our session, you'll have a little more information that will justify your excitement. Um, we will start to look at some of the visualization options. Before we get into any technical applications of LiDAR, where we do things like point classifications, things like that, initially viewing the point cloud is very often what a lot of people start with. Uh, as you'll see in that little screenshot over on the left side, LiDAR is a three-dimensional data format. So initial visualization lets you discern patterns in, in whatever you're looking at, whether it be forestry or an urban environment, or you can see some power lines in this example. So point, point cloud visualization and distinguishing points based on some of their inherent characteristics is a, a very good initial part of introdu introducing yourself to that data format. Um, once we roll up our sleeves, both literally and figuratively, we're going to start doing some data processing. And I'm going to start by some basic editing and filtering. Um, as I said, there's a lot of publicly available LiDAR data out there. Um, very often that data will satisfy your use, but often it won't. There may be some in, in, um, uh, post-processing or cleanup that needs to be done. And we'll talk about some of those procedures. There's some automatic processes that will allow you to improve the quality of your data. We'll also talk about some of those manual processes as well. Um, 
Uh, LiDAR data, as you will see in a couple minutes, has an inherent classification. Uh, every point is designated to be a particular type of surface or feature. The most common of those are going to be ground. And we'll work with those a little bit later. Um, you may find your data has a lot of unclassified points, kind of a dumping ground for anything that's not ground. And as part of the process of improving the quality of the data, we'll look at some of those reclassification tools, things like identifying vegetation or identifying uh, utility cables or power lines. Lines. Um, buildings are another common one. And we'll take a look at some of those workflows. Time permitting, we won't have a chance to do all of those, but time permitting, we'll take a look at some of those reclassification procedures. Again, giving you more intelligence, a better raw material as you embark on any proje uh, project or process with this data. For most LiDAR consumers, the data is a raw material. It's a commodity for, for generating a product. And that product very often is a DTM or a DSM, variations on the theme of a digital elevation model. DTM being a terrain model, surface model, bare earth, you may hear it referred to as bare earth. DSM is a surface model. If you're in the forestry business right here in the state of Maine, we have a lot of folks in, in the forestry business that a DSM is a surface model, allowing, to, allowing you to map, for instance, the canopy, the top of the canopy layer. So we'll create, uh, we'll at least create a DTM as part of this workflow, transforming our points into a surface that will ultimately allow us to uh, perform some additional functions. Um, I'm gonna introduce a few terrain analysis functions, things like very simple content contour generation, starting with point cloud data, how do we generate contours? Volume calculations, very um, uh, common one, being able to simply determine how much material uh, is in a certain area. A lot of the mining operators will be interested in this type of application where I've got a pile of stuff. How much is there? How much do I need to move to, or how many trucks do I need to bring to move this out of the way? Um, a more specific workflow that's very interesting, and this is probably applicable for any of you who are engineers, civil engineers, or maybe even highway department, cut and fill. Being able to uh, optimize your cut and fill calculations to minimize the required engineering for any particular engineering project. Uh, I'll hold off on that one right now because best explanation of this is actually to see how it works. Um, but again, derived initially from, from uh, uh, LiDAR as a raw material. Um, and finally, change detection. Um, this can be done in many, many different applications. And obviously, to be pertinent, it would require data to be collected over a time series. M most of the public data that we have access to is a one-off collection process. But increasingly, with the cost of LiDAR collection going down, you're finding that private companies, academic uh, institutions are out collecting data on a timed basis to see what those changes are over time. And have a very interesting exercise, again, time permitting, that I'll go through um, to show you the time uh, or change detection process over time. This is a simulated workflow using some very localized data, but hopefully it will be, it'll be meaningful. So that's my basic outline for the next hour or so. We have Q&A at the end. I didn't put that as a bullet, but hopefully we'll wrap up by about 10 till the top of the hour, giving you a chance to uh, ask some questions. So what is LiDAR? Let's begin with the basics. You can see where I've bolded the components of my uh, description here. Light detection and ranging. There's where we get the letters, LIDAR. LIDAR is a point format, a point cloud format. We tend to describe them as point clouds. It is not the only point cloud format. There are many, many other formats of point cloud available out there. Anything with an X, Y, and Z value, any points with X, Y, and Z values uh, would constitute part of a point cloud. But LIDAR is a very specific one that's collected using a very specific technology. It's laser-based. You can see my little layman's description here. Fire a laser beam, it hits a surface, it's reflected and picked up, and it's the determination of the distance, uh, or the time, I'm sorry, determination of the time, ultimately the calculated distance between the transmitter and the receiver that allows you to determine A, distance, and B, elevation of that point based on a known altitude of the, of the collection process. So that, in a very, very brief way, is how LiDAR is collected. Obviously, a single LiDAR point isn't of much use. To be of value, LiDAR data is collected um, uh, repeatedly. The, the points are very closely spaced, so it's not a single pulse, it's multiple pulses. And typically with airborne LiDAR, um, it's, it's a f uh, flight path that basically sweeps in a, uh, the uh, transmission process is in a sweeping motion, very often with publicly available data. You'll see that pattern in the data. Data, uh, that sweeping pattern. So the ultimate result of the collection process is a point cloud. Um, it can be collected by an airborne collection system. That's the most common use, at least from what we use on a daily basis. But terrestrial LIDAR is also um, uh, available. We're increasingly finding some of the unmanned aerial vehicles are being equipped with the miniaturized versions of this collection uh, technology as well. So it no longer requires a piloted aircraft to, to be collected. 
Point spacing can vary. Um, a few points, uh, which is typical for the publicly available data, a couple of points per square meter, maybe three or four points per square meter, not untypical, to several thousand or more, depending on some of the emerging technologies, like Geiger mode, uh, um, LIDAR is becoming more available. Um, also, close proximity collection at a terrestrial level will generate several thousands. Um, what you'll see when we get into our change detection exercise is a point cloud that has over a million points per square meter. So we'll hold off on that one again. Well, it's a little teaser. If, you don't, if you're thinking of breaking out, you might want to wait till the end so you can see that point cloud. Um, each um, point has a classification, as I mentioned before. Um, these are industry defined, ground, building, high vegetation, etc. Um, allowing you to distinguish points. That illustration on the left side shows brown points. Those are ground points. Uh, orange points are buildings and the green ones are vegetation. So the intelligence embedded in the point cloud allows you to derive additional products, extracted buildings, vegetation, a ground model as obviously examples. Sometimes your point cloud may have RGB or NAR and near infrared values, in which case you can also conduct an analysis of that data based on some sort of calculation like a NDVI, uh, the vegetation index or NBR, the burn uh, uh, analysis process, if you have those uh, values available. And just by way of wrapping this section up, LiDAR is being used in a variety of fields. You may not use it today, but if you're in the business of working with spatial data, chances are at some point you will be introduced to this as a data format. It is becoming very common for a lot of different applications, from urban applications, urban planning, resource management, uh, utility management, anything that addresses the 3D element of your data, LiDAR is becoming a, more of a common uh, format for use in those types of fields. So. So that's the PowerPoint bit done. What I'm going to do for the rest of my time with you today is actually look at some practical applications of LiDAR. And I'm going to bring up, um, um, as I mentioned before, Global Mapper. Those of you who haven't seen Global Mapper, it's a desktop GIS applica application. It has an add-on module, a LiDAR module, that lets you do a lot of very powerful processing with your LiDAR data. Some of those tools we'll be using today. Um, so that's that's my sales spiel out of the way. That's as much as I'll do as far as uh, trying to sell the software is concerned. Um, what I want to do first, um, kind of carrying on from the, the slides I just showed you, is to introduce the basic structure of LiDAR data. Again, for those of you who perhaps haven't seen this data format before. For this, I'm simply going to load up a file. And from off screen, I'm going to point to a an LAZ file. Now, LAZ is the suffix that's given to the compressed version of LiDAR. You may find data this, uh, with the suffix LAS. That's the uncompressed version. Both are supported in Global Mapper along with many, many, many other formats as well. So having pointed to that file, you'll see the first option I'm given here in the software is to address some of these structural characteristics. Now, to be honest, if I was new to LiDAR, I would completely be overwhelmed with the options I have here. So Almost without exception, I would say, just ignore this and just load the, the file. But just to give you a quick overview as to what we're being prompted to choose here, as you can see on the right side where my cursor is located, there are a number of classifications with checkboxes. If with the data that I'm being provided, I only wanted to see the ground points, I can simply unselect everything else and just leave this box checked. That would allow me to go straight into generating a terrain surface or whatever it is I'm going to do with my ground points. I can also apply certain filters to this data based on, for instance, um, a bounding box. If I only want points that are fall within my jurisdictional boundary, uh, if I have a polygon that defines that, I can say only load the points that fall within this constraint. I do have those options as well. Number of other options in here as well as filtering by, by return type. We'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, also, we have an option to bypass the rendering of the points. Uh, which is what we're going to see in a few minutes, and actually go straight into a grid, which is basically an elevation surface, a raster surface. So if you want to streamline your workflow, um, give me LiDAR, but I want to work with a surface, this is basically how you would do that. You would select this option and you would not see the points. For our purposes, I'm simply going to ignore all the options, all the filters, and it's going to load this file. Now, one thing to note, if you haven't worked with a lot of LiDAR data, is the file sizes tend to be very large uh, in terms of the number of files and also in terms of the actual size of the files themselves. I would recommend if you're distributing a lot of point cloud data yourself, you consider one of the compressed formats. LAZ is the one that's uh, most common. I believe uh, Esri have their own as well. Uh, ZLAS, I believe, is the, their version. But one of the compressed formats is going to save a lot of uh, storage and data transfer uh, space if you have uh, if you have um, the need to distribute your data. 
So here is my first point cloud. Over on the left side of my screen, we've got a little summary as to what's included in this one file. And you can see the number here, 13.7 million points in this what we're looking at about uh, maybe three mile by three mile box. I'm doing a quick, maybe two miles by two miles, perhaps. This is a metric, obviously. So very relatively small urban area right here in the state of Maine. We've got 13 million points giving us a kind of an, uh, an overview. Now the visual representation is displayed as noted on the left side of the screen uh, based on elevation. So we've got some very low areas. This is almost down to sea level over here. We're close to the coast. And we top out just over 110 meters right here in the middle. So we're already able to adjust the visual characteristics of the point cloud to reflect uh, the elevation values. And that's what we're seeing here. We'll get into some of the other visualization options in just a little bit. Before we get there again, the intention of this introductory uh, section is to introduce the characteristics of LiDAR. Now to do this, I'm gonna zoom all the way in and look at a specific individual point. What you're seeing here, obviously, is a very close up and for a pretty unrealistic view, but it gives you an idea as to the point spacing. And to a certain level, it also shows you the pattern of the points. While theoretically they are random, you can see a very distinct linear path here. And this would represent the Per, the perpendicular line from the flight path from the aircraft. Basically, that sweeping motion of the transmission process would have swept in that direction, um, and you'll see the results of that right here. These points are uh, in a linear pattern. Um, you'll also note the resolution. Now, there's a meter right here. This is my meter scale. So um, it looks like we're about a point per square meter, maybe a little more than that, perhaps. We'll get some confirmation on that in just a second, but you can at least see the spacing of these points. Now, to begin this analysis, we're going to use an info tool, which is a, a selection tool. And I want to select an unsuspecting point. And we're getting right down to the bare bones here. This is ultimately what LiDAR is all about. For every point, I have an elevation. In this case, it's 114.042 meters. That's a very precise elevation, right down to the millimeter level. Now, is that telling me that that is accurate to that level? Well, not necessarily, but the capability of LiDAR is such that it would um, allow me to support that degree of accuracy. This is a class one, which is an unclassified point. Um, it has an intensity value of four, and I'm not going to go into all the details, but you can see there's a lot of other information here for an individual point. Not quite why you'd want to go to the individual point level to look at this information, I don't know, but it is, uh, again, a representative value. Oops, sorry. Let me close that dialog box. A representative value that would be applied, obviously, to all of the 13 million points in my data set. Let me back up, and you can see as we do back up, those points obviously start to get a little closer spaced, relatively speaking, and form what appears almost to be a surface, a solid surface. So they are still points, but it looks like it's solidified because we're looking at it from a wider air uh, perspective. Also useful when we consider LiDAR or before you embark on any process, regardless of what application you're using, you'll want to get a better idea as to the structural characteristics of this particular file. Somebody sends you data, you download a file from uh, an online source, uh, maybe you go to the USGS national map and you grab some LiDAR from there. You want to take a look at what's in that data before you eagerly start to generate a surface or do anything uh, that would be, require analysis. In order to do that, we're going to access the metadata for this layer. And a couple of summary items you can see first off, confirmation of our point count, as we saw before, the amount of memory that this particular point cloud requires, so only 100 megabytes of memory in my case. Um, you'll notice the density as well. Now, this is calculated dynamically. This is not embedded in the file. This is something that Global Mapper figured out when it loaded the data, it looked at the coverage area, it looked at the number of points, it did a simple mathematical calculation and came up with that value, and from that, determine the point spacing as well. So the average spacing between the points, and this is not consistent, obviously, there's areas where there's sparse point coverage, as is a body of water right here, but on average, every point is about, what, 70 centimeters, what, right about, what, two feet, just over two feet from its neighbor. So that's just a kind of a summary. Also, we can get down to the individual statistics, and this is where the, the uh, process would usually begin when it comes to uh, analyzing data. In this example, and I've done a little cleanup on this point cloud myself, we are limited to two classifications, unclassified, which is our number one, and ground. If I was intending to use this point cloud for the purpose of generating a terrain model, a bare earth model, while I have 13 million points with a point density of, what did we say, about just over one point per square meter, I would lose some of that re resolution if I filter to ground. We're going to lose almost half of our points 
by removing those that are unclassified. Well, what are those unclassified points? Well, they could be trees, they could be buildings, they could be people, they could be any obstruction that is uh, other than uh, ground. Now, we're going to address that issue a little bit later. How do we know? Uh, how do we determine what's ground? Sometimes the data that's delivered to you will have that all ready to go, and you can just basically pull it off the shelf and work with it. But we're going to show you how you can actually process and improve that ground classification count yourself a little bit later. So again, just a quick overview of some of the um, uh, the statistical uh, information that's available for this point cloud. Now I know I can simply remove the points I don't want and proceed with wh whatever analysis that I was going to be involved with. We also have the option to query the data. I'm not going to do that right now simply because with 13 million points, response time's a little bit slower, but we have a, a search function that will let me show the data, not for an individual point, but in a tabular form. So every point would have a line item, just like a spreadsheet, and I can filter, query, and analyze the data without actually doing anything spatial, but just looking at the statistics that are in there, another option that's available. So visualization options. Well, as I mentioned during the introduction, the initial visualization is based on vision, and you're seeing that reflected, as I said, in this legend. There are a number of alternatives that we can apply. Um, we can vary by intensity. Now, this is exactly the same data, but the visual representation of the point cloud is reflecting that intensity value, and this gives you a good idea of the nature of the surface, the color uh, that's uh, displayed represents the type of surface. And people often look at this and say, wait, it looks just like a black and white photograph. And indeed it does. It, it, it shows you different variations in terrain. In fact, it gives you more than a black and white photograph would give you. Very often you'll see vari variations in vegetation types based on the intensity of the return. By the way, just as a side product, not something I'm going to do today, but if you needed to, you can actually create a raster version of this type of vi visualization. Um, we will be using the process of grid to create a elevation surface in a few minutes, but this is a, 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 an option where you can actually create essentially an image derived from these intensity values. Again, ultimately looking like a black and white photograph. Um, some of the other options in here, and again, I'm going to go through a few of these very quickly. We can look at the variation based on return number. Now, return number reflects one of the inherent um, characteristics of LiDAR in that any given pulse can have multiple returns. So when a, a laser pulse hits a surface, it's going to be reflected and picked up by the receiver. That pulse could also partially penetrate, either because of the nature of the surface or because it only partially hits that surface. And it may hit a second surface or sometimes even a third surface. So you get one pulse, but three or more returns. That's what we're seeing represented here. I'm not going to bring up a legend, but there will be an option to show what these colors reflect. Now, if we look at the big picture here, look back out. It's a little bit strange because we've got overlap points here. But that pattern very often will be an indication as to where there's vegetation. Uh, high vegetation specifically. Now, if you look up here in the corner of my screen, we've got a couple of open fields. Um, you'll notice there there's only a single return. There's only a single color. And that single color tells us that, there, that it, it was a single surface and obviously there was no multiple returns. Areas that are heavily forested, you'll have multiple returns to be much more common. A couple of other options here. Very quickly, we can visualize by, by uh, density. Um, we can visualize if we have the available NIR data by NDVI or NDWI, some of those uh, uh, raster analysis process, processes. We can visualize by height above ground. Now, this is going to take just a minute because what it's doing dynamically is it's addressing the likely ground surface elevation. It's doing that as a process using the same elevation legend as before. Obviously, the colors of the individual points have changed, but this is now reflecting based on the blue being this calculated ground surface, and that was generated dynamically. There was no, it was based on a calculation from a specific uh, preconceived elevation. It did that dynamically, and now it's telling me what the height above ground is. So obviously, higher trees are going to be up in the upper range of these red colors. Now, where we started with these visualization options is RGB and elevations. Now, in this case, the the Point cloud does not have any inherent RGB values. Um, sometimes you will find that the point cloud data you work with, especially photogrammetrically generated point clouds, will actually have a color associated with every point. This data, this is off the shelf data that didn't have that information. But we have an option in this software for actually adding that. And this is a very interesting tool. Um, applying color 
two LiDAR points. The color in this case is going to be applied based on an underlying layer, an underlying raster layer, which in my case is an aerial image. But you could be creative with this. I've seen folks that will overlay LiDAR on a USGS quad map and using this function basically generate a three-dimensional point cloud version of a USGS 1 to 24,000 quad map, which is very interesting. So what I'm doing very quickly in this case, sorry, wrong button, is simply applying those colors and when this process completes, all 13 million points will inherit the color of the pixel upon which the, each of those points sits. And we should, it should be apparent that the point cloud disappears. It actually hasn't disappeared. It's still there. In fact, if I turn off the underlying image, you'll see those holes reappearing. This is now the same data, but with those colors applied. And it allows me to introduce a couple of additional visualization options in the software. One is our 3D view. I'm going to pull this in from off screen here. This is a three dimensional view of the point cloud. As you can see, those nice colors have been applied. And we'll get back into looking at this in a few different contexts a little bit later. And also, we can generate what we call a profile view. Now, the profile is a cross sectional view. I basically draw a linear path, and it will show me a cutaway of the point cloud. With LiDAR data, because it's based on points, we have the option to define the width of the swath. Um, that I'd be looking at. A single line will not intersect any points, geometrically speaking, so we would not see anything. So we basically buffer the line, and I believe right now this is set to about 20 meters. You see that little pink area. I'm just going to draw a line, and it will pop up my profile view to show me a cross-sectional look of that path. Now, while this looks kind of cool, gives you that cross-sectional view, it allows you to see any weird anomalies. Um, if you have points that are sitting obviously way up in the air, you can see those quite clearly. Um, so visually, it gives you a lot of information, but it's also an editing tool. You can uh, actually perform certain edits by looking at this lateral perspective. You can also digitize. Uh, you can draw features by tracing along profiles. I'm not going to get into that workflow today, but that certainly is another option. So just a, a couple of different visualization options uh, that can be applied when uh, working with, uh, with your point cloud data. Next section in my bullets was uh, editing data. Um, let me go back to my default view again. Go back to looking at it by elevation. So this is the way we started. Now, when it comes to editing data, there's a number of things that we can do. Um, as I showed you previously, I can select an individual point and look at all of the characteristics. By the way, you'll notice because of the visualization options that we applied, we now have RGB values. We also have a height above ground value. Those are now embedded in each point. So they're actually part of the attribute table. If I was to simply export this file as a new LAS file or a new LAS file, well, those additional attributes would be inherited. So a lot of folks are just using uh, the application here just for that type of process. I, I just want to take a point cloud and make one minor change and then export it and send it to my client. That's certainly doable here. Um, it takes all the fun out of LiDAR, though. The, the fun of LiDAR is actually you do, using the data to actually create something, which is what we're going to do in a few minutes. But um, creating a, uh, selecting a single point, yeah. You can do it, not that useful. Similarly, using my vector editing tool, my digitizer, I can select an individual point and I can edit that point. So this is getting down to the point level where it's again noted the classification, the elevation, and the intensity, as well as a number of, of the industry flags you'll see in here. And I can again change any of these if I wanted to. Not that I ever would, it's impractical, but I could. It's probably more likely you'll ch you'll select a number of points. I'm using a, a box to select. You can also use a, a polygon and just grab all the points that are within a certain polygon area. Maybe you should do it over in the green area so we can see it a little clearly. So now all of those points collectively can be edited. So you'll make all of the points that fall within a certain area, a certain type, you can certainly do that. We can also copy and paste. If we want to take these points and migrate them into their own layer, simply control C, control V, they would be isolated. You would have a subset of your data that is constrained by whatever geographic extent you're, you're most interested in. So a lot of editing tools are sim superficial like that, simply um, changing the high level of your point, the, uh, the point cloud at a high level. Um, the other uh, filtering process may involve filtering. So again, we have, in this case, only two classifications present. But if we wanted to isolate one or other, we can simply initiate a filtering process. Now, this list that you're seeing is exactly the same list that we saw when we imported the data. But my typical workflow required, usually requires me to look at the data before I'm intelligent enough to make these decisions. We've done that already. We know that there's only two classes here. I don't want my own classified data. I can simply uncheck that. or I want to be more sure, you can disable all and just leave my ground points. Um, by the way, the other filtering option here is to filter based on return type. 
Now, perhaps the most useful here is the option for last return. If your intention is to use a point cloud for ground modeling, DTM generation, every ground point we would assume would be the last return per pulse. It's very unlikely you're going to get a first of two returns that corresponds with ground. Typically, the ground does not allow laser LIDAR to penetrate. So simply filtering to only the last return will give you a higher level of assurance that the points that remain actually are ground points. So that might be one option here that you might want to choose as well. Uh, for our case, we'll just limit it to ground. We'll click OK. And you'll see the point cloud has thinned out just a little bit. We've lost a few of our, our unclassified points. People often look at this and are interested in the fact that although we know this is fairly heavy foliage right in here, this is a fairly dense canopy, we still have a lot of points. And the simple reason for that is A, because yeah, we get multiple returns per pulse. So while it may hit foliage, it, that laser may eventually penetrate and hit ground. But also the fact that the, the foliage, while it looks solid from the, uh, on, to, on top, when you get actually into the forest and look up, there actually are holes in the foliage. While it's not as dense, you can see uh, you will be able to see uh, the, the sky so that those laser, laser pulses can penetrate. So at this stage, we would be in a position where we could say, okay, now I want to generate some a ground surface. Now I want to generate ultimately some contours because I know that the points that remain here are only ground points. And we can also confirm that. I haven't actually done this recently, but we'll just check if I run my profile. It, while it appears to have an array of points, the reason for that is because we're looking at that swath that I mentioned before. But all of the unclassified points are missing. And actually, I can confirm that. We'll go back and re-enable all. And we'll go back in and look at that profile view once again, but this time visualized by classification. This is now gray points being unclassified, ground points are ground. We'll run that profile view again, and hopefully you'll see that the ground points are ground points, and those that are vegetation in this case are still unclassified, and those are the ones that were limited. I wouldn't get a weird terrain surface correlating with the uh, top of the canopy in this case. One of the other processes we can address, and for this, I'm actually going to unload this file. It's asking me to save any changes. I'm going to say no. Uh, I'm going to load a new file here from off screen, and this is going to show us a different filtering option. This is a more automated process. Here we have a small section of some point cloud data right up the road from where I'm sitting. This is the uh, capital of Maine here, the state of Augusta, uh, the city of Augusta. This is the Kennebec River. And already you can see there's a little bit of a problem with this data set, and we're going to kind of show this in more detail if we profile it again. Um, the one meter uh, elevation here, let me actually constrain it just a little bit. You can see um, uh, the zero meter elevation, you'll see there are points actually below. And the reason for that is right here on the Kennebec River, um, the riverbed or the river is so shallow that the riverbed actually had some ground returns. These are actually technically the riverbed itself. We would want to eliminate the likes of those before we embark on any um, ground modeling process. Um, also, and sometimes I find these and sometimes I don't. I'll see if I can find them uh, somewhere in this area. There we go. There's a couple of points that are, you can see the, the ground profile is constrained now because we've got a couple of points that are way up there, over 300 meters, what, almost, uh, what, 1,000 feet up in the air. I can only assume that these are birds. I can't confirm that, but it's quite likely as the aircraft was flying over, there was a bird or a couple of birds flying underneath. It just happened to be in the path of one of the, the LIDAR pulses, and you can see that was collected here. Now, if we embarked on any process with this raw data without any doing any processing, we would get some weird results, to be honest. We would get, uh, obviously, a spike if we were doing some sort of vegetation analysis or if these happen to be ground points, which they're not. We would get kind of a spike in our terrain as well. So there's a tool for automatically addressing this, and this is something I would recommend you do with any point cloud. Um, addressing the idea of noise. First thing we can do is define those points that are obviously wrong, those that are beyond or expected uh, local variance from the average. I'm going to keep this to one standard deviation. And we can also specify specific constraints here. One thing you'll note here that when I choose points that are outside a specified elevation range, I have somewhere in this point cloud a point that's actually at minus 24. Again, we know that's not correct. I'm not sure where that one is, but we'll want to eliminate that and the others as well by cutting this off at zero. And I just happen to know from my own experience, about 80 meters is as tall as we're going to get in this area. That's the top, the tall of the top of the tallest tree. Everything else here should be fine. We'll click OK, and what you should see is those noise points have now been addressed. A couple of noise points over here in the in the uh, air, this area. Maybe they're um, weird anomalies in my own classified data, but certainly the 
the points that are uh, in, the, um, in the river are noted here. And if I can find those birds again, uh, they're somewhere over here. I should note where they are. Well, anyway, you take my word for it. Those are also flagged as noise points. Now, we could have also deleted these immediately, but now that we have assigned them as noise, it's very easy to go back into the filtering process as we did before and simply remove them from the view. Any analysis I do would have would disregard those. So it's a procedure I would suggest you embark on just to, again, at a high level, just remove all of those points that are beyond the expected range. Okay, so let's continue this idea of reclassification. Now I'm gonna bring up another example of some data. And I have to say that this one is a little unrealistic, uh, but I do this for effect. This again was derived from some publicly available data. This happens to be uh, an area of suburban Portland, Maine, right down the road from where I'm sitting right now. I'll turn off the point cloud so we can see where we are. This is just a low resolution background image. Those of you who are familiar with the area, maybe you've traveled up to Acadia National Park or some of those beautiful parts of the coast. This is the interstate that goes around the edge of Portland. This is Interstate 95, and this is one of the major thoroughfares going into the city. This is, I believe, called Warren Avenue. And I chose this area because it's kind of an interesting mix of big box retail, low density residential, and a little bit of forestry thrown in here as well. The point cloud that we took a quick look at is, as you can see, based on classification, completely unclassified. Now, it didn't come this way. I, I removed all the classification for effect to kind of show you the process. Because what we want to do is have the application here identify geometrically which of these points are likely going to be ground points. And there's an automatic tool for doing this. This is a very, very powerful function of this software. Um, not only for dealing with point clouds that don't come classified, uh, photogrammetrically generated point clouds, for instance, um, this is a procedure which will allow you to identify ground points within those types of point clouds, uh, but also to improve the point cloud quality. We very often have overlap points or unclassified points that obviously are part of a surface, and this will allow Global Mapper to address that. So just a couple of things here. I'm just going to quickly go through the settings. I'm going to go to the details, our, our uh, bin sizes to check is 5 meters. I'm just checking my notes here. We'll use a, a 0.8 meter max departure. Everything else here should be fine. Now, with these settings applied, I'm going to click OK, and what you should see visually on the uh, screen is a new color will be added. Now, I have to say, this point cloud is very small. Happened very quickly, obviously, just a few seconds. This has only got about a million and a half points. But you can see the result of that process is that it was able to identify those points that are ground. I love to use my profile tool. Once again, I'll do that, and you'll see very clearly the ground points have been geometrically identified and uh, uh, reclassified. I can now turn off the unclassified, embark on the process of generating contours if that was my workflow, if I was required to do that. Now, we won't have time for this next process in today's presentation, but typically what we do uh, with the remaining unclassified points is to identify vegetation and buildings as well and ultimately generate an extraction process. That's for another day. Maybe if they invite me back, I'll do another presentation on, on the feature extraction. But for us, ground is where we wanted to go with this and ground is what we get, uh, what we're able to get from this process, which then gives us the raw material for generating a surface. Now, let me close this and once again, unload this point. But with apologies if I'm going a little fast here. Obviously, this is not a workshop per se. I'm mostly, mostly showing you what you can do with the data. Um, let me once again load up another pre-configured workplace, uh, workspace. And this is going to be similar to the one that we used before, uh, but it's pre-filtered. So we're going to go back to where we were a few minutes ago, and we're going to go through the process of transforming essentially a series of points, X, Y, and Z points, with all of the other information as well, into a raster surface, which will obviously then give us the ability to do things like contour generation, etc. Once this finally completes loading, thank you, I should have left it up from before, I suppose, we are back to, okay, where we, if I talk slowly, I'll catch up, where we were, okay. Um, this is a pre-classified workspace with my ground points. I've identified vegetation in here as well. Now, I'm going to go back to um, looking at it by elevation. Now, you can see the elevation values here um, up to about 110 meters. This does not necessarily reflect ground. We know that there are tree points in here. So while this represents the full extent of the, point, uh, the points in this area, um, I want to apply the filter. Now, I could apply the filter um, to remove the non-ground points using the same method as before, but I'm going to do it a slightly different way. We're going to embark on a gridding process. 
Uh, gridding in this context basically means creating an elevation grid, creating a raster gridded surface. And there are a number of options that we can apply. I'm not going to worry about the naming convention here, but we could give the resulting layer a name. We can use simple triangulation to initiate this gridding process. Now, triangulation would basically address every point and generate us an array of triangles. Basically, that's how the process works. An irregular triangulated network uh, that would uh, basically generate the basis of a surface. The raster process would generate the surface from that. Um, we also have a few options for doing what's called binning. Now, for most applications, I recommend these. If our intention is to generate a DTM, our terrain model or bare earth model, what this will allow us to do is to define my resolution. I'm going to make this a manual resolution of one meter. We don't know what this point spacing is, but we're going to specify that every pixel will be a one meter pixel in this resulting uh, um, output. And based on that size area, Global Mapper is going to look for the minimum value, which we know the minimum value is the most likely to be ground. So if there are any anomalies, this will automatically, oops, automatically remove those. Let's try that one more time. Um, so again, back to one meter resolution. Now, I'm not going to worry about any other settings here. We'll click OK and we'll let this run through its process. And when it completes, we will see a surface now. Don't worry about the color of the surface for the time being. There, also a little better. We now have a raster surface model. This is now a, oh, you know what? I just realized I forgot to do one thing. Sorry. Talk, talking too much and not actually concentrating on what I'm doing. Let me close that because I forgot to filter. Uh, so let's go back again and thankfully remember the setting from before. Let's choose one meter again. This time before we click OK, we'll filter at this stage. Now, you'll, uh, the reason I bring this up is you'll see some of the other filtering options that are available. You can filter based on color. You can filter based on different elevations. You can filter based on intensity. So really, the sky's the limit. Any of the available attributes associated with your point cloud can be used as a basis for filtering. My intention here is to clear all and just leave my ground points in this case. And we'll click OK. Now, this should give us a little bit of a better looking result. And by the way, that visualization that we saw initially as a slope shader, it's a, a way to look at terrain, not based on elevation, but based on the slopes. I'll just bring it back up again so we can explain in a little more detail what we're looking at. So this is showing me a slope analysis. Uh, this is, these are degree values over the left side. So the darker areas are steeper slopes, lighter areas, lighter slopes. Let me go back to my standard shader again. So that's the process of transforming XYZ point cloud data into something that's now usable. We have a surface. We can look at this surface in 3D just like we did with our point cloud. There's my nice hill right here. We can pop up the, uh, the um, exaggeration and look a little bit higher. And you can see we can change the background color as well, make it a nice tropical sunny day. Uh, we can generate a fly through. We can generate basically a, a, a uh, flight through the terrain is an option for doing that. You can record that and then I'll put that in a movie file if that's part of your workflow. So there are different options here. One of the more common applications for working with this type of terrain data um, is generating contours. And I'm just going to zoom a little closer. We'll keep this fairly localized here. Um, contour generation, very simple process. Again, we have another component here, a little button in the, in the toolbar allows us to define the parameters of my contours. What we're doing here is, again, generating a new layer. This is going to be a line layer, a vector line layer. And we can simply define the contour interval by specifying that value. Right now, it's set to 5 meters. I'm going to make these a little higher. I'm going to bring it down to 1 meter. And we can establish uh, index contours, minor and major. A few other options in here I'm not going to be too concerned about. I uh, will disregard those that are a little too small for what we want today. So under 20 meters works fine. And finally, I just want to limit this to my screen view, not the whole loaded data, so it's a little faster. I click OK, and we should see some nice contour lines, very quickly generated, turning off the surface, you can see my contours. And maybe I would have smoothed them a little more. We have a smoothing process that we can initiate now if we want to take a little bit of this angular, uh, angularness, I don't know if that's a word, but <laughs> we take the angular nature of my contours out. Again, I'll just initiate that smoothing process for one selected line. You can see it smooths it right up there, makes it a little more aesthetically pleasing. Or maybe not as accurate, but a little more aesthetically pleasing. And we could do that collectively for all of our contours if necessary. Now, just kind of complete this process. If my objective was to take LiDAR and generate a contour layer in shapefile format, I simply initiate an export now and generate a shape file, or generate a KML file, or generate a file that I'm going to bring into CAD, DXF, or DWG. Process is very simple. 
let's go back to this surface and look at a couple of other workflows. Um, I'm just seeing how much time I have. I think I should have enough time. Um, I can go a little bit more than the top of the hour. I don't know if you folks have the luxury of being able to stay around, but hopefully it will not uh, impede on your uh, productive time too much. But I want to show you a couple of variations on volume calculation. Now, the first one is very simple and very, very powerful in my opinion, because if I show you, uh, let me find the appropriate data here. This is actually a little further along the coast from where I'm sitting. This is an example of some point cloud data from the little town of Castine, which is uh, along the coast, if you ever a chance to visit a beautiful little town. I chose this example because it's got two interesting anomalies in the data. The first one is right here. I have no idea what it is, but if I draw a cross-sectional profile, you'll see there's obviously a mound of some sort here. My objective in this exercise is to determine the volume of material that's in this mound. I want to calculate the volume. Um, if it was based on the fact that the underlying surface was completely flat, that would be a fairly straightforward computation. But because it's a seemingly on an inclined plane, the volume calculation actually has to derive its base elevation from the immediate surroundings of the pile. And I'll show you how I did that in just a second. The other interesting feature, which I didn't realize initially, but I found after the fact, is this depression in the terrain. And I have since learned that this is a quarry. Apparently, the um, granite that was mined here was used for some of the buildings down in New York City. So you guys may be walking on some former uh, main uh, quarried qu uh, granite. Again, uh, objective in this little exercise is to determine how much granite was actually removed. Now, you'll see I've pre-configured this outline of the pile I want to measure. There's no specific characteristics associated with this line other than I, did, I drew it as quickly as possible to outline the area of interest. What Global Mapper will do in this process is to determine precisely the elevation at every point along the edge and use that as the basis for actually generating a surface and ultimately for uh, calculating the volume above that surface. So that's the explanation. The practical application is a lot simpler. We simply go to pile volume, and within a few seconds, it will tell me that the total volume of that pile is, I've got it set to cubic yards in this case, is about three to over 3,000 cubic yards. If I need to bring trucks in to move that away, I know exactly what the uh, total volume is. Very, very simple process. The other op uh, alternative, the other example, I should say, with this depression works exactly the same way. So again, pile volume, although it's not a pile in this case, we'll see the results of this calculation will be negative numbers. So again, based on the elevation around the edge, it's there was about 12,000 cube yards of granite pulled out of this quarry at stage in the past. So again, quick calculation, and you can see the negative value. So that's a very, very powerful, very simple, but very powerful tool, obviously derived initially from LiDAR that was converted into a terrain, and now we can quickly generate those, uh, or calculate those uh, um, volumes. This is actually the last one I'm going to have a chance to, to work on today. With apologies, I didn't get done everything I wanted to do. But I want to show you the cut and fill analysis. Um, once again, final workspace. This is a volume calculation process, but it's got a little bit more. Um, oops. If I can find the file. I'll try again. It's going to bring up an area of LiDAR-derived terrain before, and you'll see right on the screen is a rectangle. This would represent a simulated engineering site, perhaps a construction site. If I look at this in 3D, you can see my choice of location for this project was probably not the best because it's on the edge of a slope. What I want to do in this exercise is to create a flat surface based on the extent of this rectangle, but that flat surface is going to be uh, optimized in such a way that the cut areas and the fill areas are going to have the same volume or approximately the same volume. I want to equalize cut and fill. Now it's going to perform two processes for me. It's initially going to give me what those volumes are and then it's going to create a modified surface based on the flattening of this rectangular feature. Now you can do this obviously for polygons, rectangles in this case, or linear features as well. So if you're planning a highway through the terrain, you can see how much cut will be needed and how much fill will be needed. And it nicely models that as a result. Now, once again, that's the verbal explanation. The practical uh, demonstration is very, very simple. The, again, the rectangle doesn't have any specific inherent characteristics other than the fact that I drew it manually. Um, I simply initiate the process of determining my flattened site plan. 
Now, a couple of options to, to choose here. I give the layer a name, so we want to create a new elevation layer, so we'll give that a name. I could, if I needed to, specify what that height would be. If my surveyors have already said, oh, this project's going to be at a height of 100 meters, it would still give me those volumes. It would still generate those uh, that surface, but it would not be uh, equalized. What I want to do in this case is to actually equalize the cut and fill volumes, have Global Mapper determine what that elevation would be. We're also going to um, initiate slopes around the edge, which adds a lot of complexity to the calculation. How do we equalize if we know we integrate the, the flattened surface into the surrounding terrain with a slope value. So again, there's a lot of very powerful and complicated math going on on the hood. Thankfully, user experience is very simple. We click OK with these settings this list, and it's going to try a few different variations to see if it, if it comes close to that break-even height. And when it finishes, take just a few seconds, it's going to give me a dog box showing me the optimal values. And the break even, I think if I talk slowly, it will catch up. There we go. You can see it went, actually went down from 109, the initial setting, and it stopped at 102.584. This is the break even height. This is the height that would equalize cut and fill. Now you'll see the values are not exactly the same. They're off by a little bit, but that's simply because of the resolution of this data. Um, we're not getting precise, but it's you know close enough that an uh, initial analysis will tell us how much material would need to be moved around. Now, the results of this are that if we were flattening the surface, we wouldn't need to remove material from the site or bring material in. Using this break-even height, we could equalize our cut and fill areas with the slopes factored in as we saw. Now, the final part of this process, if I click OK, is actually to generate what that surface would look like. And I'll pop up my 3D view one more time, and hopefully it'll give us a good idea. Oh. Sorry, I've got to change one setting in here because we don't want to view multiple surfaces, just the one. And you'll see now my flat surface with those slopes. A little bit exaggerated in terms of the elevations, but you can see very clearly we have a, a flat surface, 102 meters or whatever that height would be, with my cut values and my fill values equalized. And with apologies for the hasty walkthrough, didn't get to do change detection, unfortunately, but hopefully that gave you an idea as to some of the things you can do with LiDAR data, starting with the initial point cloud uh, um, and being able then to uh, uh, perform various processes ultimately with my terrain surface, being able to do things like volume calculation. Razi, any questions? Uh, thank you, David. Uh, appreciate uh, phenomenal, phenomenal uh, presentation. Uh, we are now open for questions, as you can see with uh, David's slides. Uh, for those that have any questions, please uh, start sending those in. Uh, I will be moderating each question. As each question comes in, I will read uh, the question so that everyone can hear the question, and then allow time for David uh, to respond. So I'll give you guys about 30 seconds or so, uh, send those in, and David, he's uh, able to answer all, every single question uh, that will come in, so we will go through that. Uh, so please send in those questions. We will, we will uh, try to answer each one. And again, this, uh, this webinar is uh, being recorded, so we have access to those as well. Uh, uh, as, as we're waiting for these questions to come in, uh, David, there's a lot of... Uh, uh, messages thanking you for the great presentation and kudos uh, from from the audience. Uh, and we have Thank a few questions that are ready to go. Them. We'll start with the first one. We'll start with the first one, uh, David. Uh, the the question here says, uh, could you mention some other software options? Um. I, I'm always a little hesitant to do that because it's not, I mean, my sphere of expertise is obviously with the application I work with every day. I mean, I, I, I didn't want to come across as too much of an evangelist, but I'm a huge fan of Global Mapper and I have been since, for many years. I worked down the road at Delorme. Many of you may have heard of Delorme. I worked there. I use Global Mapper every day. And now that it's part of the Blue Marble family, I, I, I was thrilled to be able to be part of this company and be able to work with it. Um, obviously, ArcGIS has a LiDAR capability. Um, I'm not sure. I haven't actually worked a lot. I know they're they're looking at their, had looked at um, uh, developing their own point cloud format, specifically the ZLAS format. Um, I'm not sure about QGIS. If you're going with the open source, I don't know. I've never used QGIS for any point cloud processing. For some of the extraction capabilities and, and uh, 
driving intelligence. Uh, PIX4D is a very powerful application uh, generating point clouds. We've actually developed a similar tool in Global Matter for point cloud generation. Um, Agisoft is another one um, that we might want to take a look at. Um, going to some of the uh, events and trade shows, I have talked to a few companies. A lot of European companies are developing some very low cost tools as well. So suggestion is just get into Google, go into Google. Hopefully you'll find Global Mapper first. That's my, my hope. But <laughs> if you don't, there are a number of other applications for, for point cloud processing. Thank you, David. Uh, next question. I have heard that LiDAR contours are very noisy, tight curves, and closed loops. I didn't see that in your demo. Please comment. Okay, so yes, uh, depending on what you do with the LiDAR. L LiDAR, again, I have to say, LiDAR is a raw material, very much a commodity. What we did as part of the process was generate a surface. So it's, it's really the surface itself that's going to determine the nature of the contours. If I had a triangulated surface, a, a surface derived from a tin, uh, if I had done that work, uh, completed that workflow, you would have seen very, very angular, very harsh co contours. And that's simply because of whether you want to consider them anomalies to, or to be more accurate representations of the terrain. When I went through the process of binning, that binning process um, aggregated the elevations for a certain area. So it removed by, by default some of those anomalies. Also, during the contour generation process, there was a, an option to smooth the contours automatically. Now, you could argue that if you smooth the contour, you're losing a little bit of the spatial integrity of that data by cutting corners or making it look pretty for the sake of, of aesthetics. You know, you, I'm not going to say which is right or which is wrong. Is an angular contour a more precise representation of the terrain? If your intent is um, smooth contours, then you can smooth them. There are geometric uh, editing tools that let you take uh, the pixels and any uh, linear object, whether it be contours or anything else, and basically cut the corners, essentially spline them if you like. Um, so while yes, I would, I would agree that if you're basing your contours on a tin that's generated from LiDAR, they're going to look very harsh. There are ways around that. Now, I don't know if this was mentioned as well, but one of the options I chose was to re remove those small, those outlying contours, and I put a threshold of 20 meters in there. That's a fairly high threshold, to be honest. But if you have these little outliers, the little floating contours, um, you can apply a filter there that way as well, either as a pre-process or as a post-process to say, take every line that's under a certain distance and just delete it. That's an option. So there are ways, the ways to improve the quality is my the bottom line. Thank you, David. Uh, we have uh, several more questions. Just a reminder, uh, please send in your questions. If you're unable to stay past uh, the time, we will answer your question, and this is being recorded. It will be posted on the New York GIS Association website, uh, as well as our social uh, media outlets. So if you have questions you're unable to stay, send those in. David has uh, uh, given the okay to take the time to answer each of those. So next question, David. Can you briefly describe the change detection workflow? Sure, absolutely. Good question, and I apologize. Uh, by the way, I should say, and again, without doing too much plugging, um, on our website, in the Blue Marble Geo website, you'll see the address right here on the screen. There's, there, We have webinars that we do ourselves. We have them live occasionally. We record them. It's a lot easier recording them than it is doing them live, but we have an entire series eight, I think, in LiDAR processing, which go into a lot of the details that I briefly went through today. So the change detection, basically the way that works, you have, you have multiple surfaces, two surfaces typically, uh, collected over a time for whatever that time frame is. Um, you basically create a grid for each one, and there are mathematical computations that you apply to a, determine the volume difference between those two surfaces, uh, which we did in a slightly different way with our volume calculation. It's a little more, much more kind of localized and precise change, but also to model the difference, and that's the key. There's a component of Global Mapper for basically comparing two terrain surfaces. You can do things like average those surfaces, find the difference between the surfaces, multiply them together if that's relevant. I'm not sure when it would be, but basically you're, you're taking each overlapping pixel and you're applying some sort of formula uh, you know, determining the relationship between the two. And for the change detection, it's a simple subtraction. You say, here's what the, the situation looked like in June, here's what it looks like in September, subtract one from the other, and it actually generates a new visualization, a model of the difference, so to speak. So you actually get, obviously, a very intense color where there's been an increased change. There's a very interesting workflow that I've done right down the road from where I'm sitting in Popham Beach, which is along the coast of Maine, where there was a very uh, major uh, erosion problem. They lost a lot of the beach because of a natural cycle and erosion, and we actually undertook it 
to show how much material actually left the area. And it turned out there wasn't that much. It just moved around a lot. The, the sand was still there, but just in different areas. So again, all we did was take surf, uh, surface model analysis from two different time frames and run a quick subtraction to see you know, what the difference was. So yeah, good question. Apologies again. I didn't have a chance to do that today, but head over to our website and you can see, see that uh, work in action. Thank you, David. Next question. When I obtain last data from the national map, it seems to only have ground and unclassified. Is that typical? Is there a way to get the data from USGS that is already classified? Uh, you're going to feel most data is going to be exactly as you described. The ex expectation being that most people who are consuming LIDAR are interested in specifically um, at ground points. What remains unclassified, you have to do a little work usually for that. Um, uh, depending on when you grab the data, depending on the area, depending on what was collected, you may find a few other classifications. But what you've seen is fairly typical. Uh, that is going to be ground and unclassified. Now, one of the things I didn't do today, once again, we have videos on our website to go through into this procedure, is to basically apply more intelligence to those unclassified points, vegetation. You saw the results of it, but I didn't have a chance to actually go through the workflow. But uh, yeah, fairly typical. I should also say, if you're interested in seeing what data is available, what I've done here is open up the uh, online data portal in Global Mapper. There's a direct link here to the national map, uh, as you can see. Now, what this does is actually very cool. Um, it's hopefully going to bring up my browser. I think my browser's off screen here. Um, <laughs> maybe you should take my word for it. Basically, what it does is it transposes your current map extent into the national map. So you basically can see for any project area you have loaded what data is available and immediately download it. It's a very, very convenient tool. This is like an online access to data for my geographic extent. Uh, from the national map. So it kind of, you mentioned national map, so I just thought I'd show that as a sideline. But in regards to what you're going to find with that data, yeah, absolutely. On ground and unclassified are by far the most common. You, you, look for overlap as well. Um, overlap points are very often discarded because there's a very low confidence rate in those overlapped points. But you can, using the analysis and, and reclassification tools in Global Map, for instance, uh, extract some ground points from those overlap points as well. Excellent. Thank you, David. Next question. Uh, this is the last question at the moment, unless another one comes in. Early in the demo, you said you can choose to view points or a grid. How does the grid differ from a DEM or a DEM? It doesn't. It's just two different terms, same, same thing. There's a lot of terminology being thrown around today without, unfortunately, the luxury of explaining. A grid, and I hate the term grid, to be honest, because grid is used in so many different contexts. A grid could be a lot long grid. Grid could be a sampling grid that you overlay on top of a, an area for scientific purposes. But gridding in the context of what we're looking at today is the process of transforming points into a surface. What we did using this tool uh, was gridding, creating an elevation grid. Now, in the dialog box that you pointed out, the first one that we saw, Basically, what we would have done had we chosen that option is go straight to generating a surface just like this. And again, 99.9% .9 of the time, I would, I would discourage you from doing that as an initial process simply because you want to take a look at the data first. You want to take a look at what's exactly what exactly is in that point cloud before you make that decision. But that's a good question, and unfortunately, it's just a case of the terminology. A grid, a DTM, a DEM. Uh, a, an elevation surface, all variations on the same thing, basically. Excellent. Dave. Next question. In your cut and fill surface demo, can you then generate grading contours? Grading contours. I'm not sure I understand what grading contours are, but you can certainly generate contours. That is one thing. Uh, uh, one of the things that we do when we demo this, um, probably missing from the workflow, is when we calculated the uh, initial elevation, we, we don't know where that is. We don't know what that cutoff is. Somewhere along the in, in this contouring area, there is a line uh, which represents the cutoff between what will be cut and filled. I'm not sure, again, if this is answering the question, but if I go back to my original terrain surface, let me turn off the one that we modified. If I go back to my original terrain surface, one of the options we have in the contouring uh, function, I'll select the polygon, is to limit the contour to a specific height. 
In this case, we'll say, I don't remember exactly what the value is, 102.5 or thereabouts, but whatever that value is, we can plug that in here, limit the contour to just that height. In other words, it's not going to generate contours based on an interval, but based on a specific elevation. I'm also limited to what I've, my um, bounding polygon, the selected area feature, and I'll click OK. And can't see it with the terrain surface on there, but if I turn it off, that line represents the break even or the cutoff, if you like, above which is going to be cut, below which is going to be filled. So again, superimposing that on you know whatever engineering drawing you have, or uh, even on the terrain surface, will give you that. Now I'm not sure if that again is the correct response. If you're simply generating contours, if we go back to the accumulated version of our two layers. If we generate a contours now, obviously this is exactly flat. You would not get any contour coverage here, but you would get contours that would represent the cut and fill areas. So you could generate contours now that would be reflecting the modified terrain surface. Excellent, David. I don't, I don't see any additional questions. Um, I think we gave enough time for anyone to submit those questions. Uh, with that, uh, just one of those closing remarks. Uh, uh, again, the New York State GIS Association, uh, this is part of our 2018 uh, webinar series. Uh, my name is Razi Kassed. I'm a co chair of the Professional Development Committee uh, as well as the chair of the Membership Committee. Uh, in addition, I'm a project manager here at uh, a company called Eagle View. And uh, I want to thank uh, David uh, with Blue Marble. Uh, geographics for giving us uh, a phenomenal presentation, giving us his time, uh, his professional development uh, knowledge and experience. I, I, I think everyone uh, found it uh, extremely um, informational and useful. Uh, we got a ton of uh, attendees. And again, look out for uh, our future webinars that we hope to host uh, in the upcoming months. We, uh, we're looking to do about one uh, one webinar per month. We might have about keep, keep uh, Keeping keep in the loop with our uh, info and information. Uh, David, anything else uh, you'd like to add before we sign off? No, just a thank you from me as well. I mean, I, the, my, my presence here is simply is a result of us attending the uh, conference on Lake Placid. Hopefully, I got to meet, meet some of you there. That was an excellent event, one of the best we've done for quite some time. So we will definitely be back there and hopefully have a chance to meet some of you folks in person uh, You know, when next time we're there. Great. Great to uh, have you, David, again. And thank you all for attending. I hope, uh, hope to see you in the future uh, for future webinars. Uh, and with that, signing off. Thank you, and have a good rest of the day.